Good evening, everyone. We're about to start, so I invite you all to take a seat, and then in one minute or two, we'll start our Ocean Forum. Thank you for being here. Ja, dann will ich vielleicht auf Deutsch ganz kurz noch eine kleine Einleitung machen. Schön, dass ihr alle da seid. Mein Name ist Frank Schweikert von der Deutschen Meeresstiftung. Wir generieren zusammen mit der Boot Düsseldorf diese großartige Fläche La für Ocean. Es sind auf über 800 Quadratmetern 80 Akteure, die hier vertreten sind, um einen Beitrag zu leisten für gesunde Gewässer, für einen sauberen, gesunden Ozean. Und ich bin da total glücklich, weil diese Initiative steht ganz unter den Zielen der UN-Dekade der Ozeanforschung für nachhaltige Entwicklung. Wir sind also ein offiziell zugelassenes Projekt in diesem Sinne und darüber da, darüber sind wir sehr geehrt und freuen uns sehr und auch schön, dass ihr alle da seid heute beim offiziellen Ozeanforum der Boot in Düsseldorf. Ähm, wir haben uns äh, darauf geeinigt, dass wir, weil wir sehr viele internationale Gäste auch haben, dass wir dieses Ozeanforum in englischer Sprache machen. Ich glaube, das äh, kriegt ihr alle irgendwie hin und äh, begrüßen Sie mit einem großen Applaus die Moderatorin des Abends, Laura Meyer. Thank, thank you very much, Frank. And as you've heard, I'm Laura Meyer. I'm a lawyer and specializing in international law of the sea and environmental law. And at the moment, I'm pursuing a master in that field at Utrecht University. And I'm very honored to be moderating this esteemed panel today with so many interesting speakers. And as we have a very full program ahead, I would like to set some fair play rules for all the speakers. Everyone will speak about five minutes and in the back we have a little sign which kind of indicates you when it's time to wrap up and then I'll just come onto the podium so we make sure that we also stay in time. The Ocean Forum today will be in the light of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Ten years, ten challenges, one ocean. The ocean we need for the, the science we need for the ocean we want. A once in a lifetime opportunity for ocean actors across the world to come together to generate knowledge and foster the partnerships needed to support a well-functioning, productive, resilient and sustainable ocean. The Ocean Decade has identified seven outcomes, and you can also see it on the exhibition over there that there are seven themed islands, and also this, the speeches that we would hear today are aligned with these seven decade outcomes. And I'm very, very excited about our first speaker. She is not only one of my personal role models, but also a true hero in ocean conservation. Please help me welcome you to the founder of Mission Blue, who is also a biologist, oceanographer, explorer, and author, her deepness, Dr. Sylvia Earle. She will be here in a video message. It made me believe that it was okay to do things no matter <laughs> what. I have an older brother and a younger brother. And I was one of the boys, if you will, <laughs> tomboy, if you will. Although my mother did say when I was a teenager that I could look forward to a career perhaps as a teacher, as a nurse, something really exciting. I could be an airline stewardess, <laughs> not a pilot, not a doctor, you know, not a superintendent of schools. It was just the way things were. Why shouldn't I be able to use capabilities that I had to do what my brothers could do, what Cousteau did. Along the way, I found that many people did think it was not just unusual, but preposterous. <laughs> When I was selected to be an aquanaut of the mission in 1970, it was still considered to be unusual enough for women to want to be underwater explorers. The application for being a part of that, didn't even bother to say that you had to be a man. Unlike the astronaut program that was going on at that time, it was clear this was for men only. But the head of the program for the Tech Tech project that had men and women living underwater for two weeks 
at a time. He was philosophical about it. More than that, he was practical. He said, well, half the fish are female. I guess we could put up with a few women. The, the Navy personnel involved were not quite so enthusiastic about it. There is no question about it that there's still a gender bias with compensation for equal performance, for selection to be in charge of various projects. It's just part of our culture. But I have to say that it is exciting to see women CEOs. Uh, I personally have served on the boards of major corporations, but always in the minority, always in the minority. And I, there is this, this attitude sometimes that you're there because you're a woman, you're the token woman. Today, young women wanting to be oceanographers find that the doors are open. You can go aboard ships. You can be chief scientist on expeditions at sea. Kids, they're all explorers. Little girls, little boys, doesn't matter. They're just curious. We shape categories. The boys can do this. Girls shouldn't be doing this. Or sometimes we have the joy of just saying, I don't care what people think. I'm going to go this way because I really want to know what's out there. Those are the explorers who emerge irrespective of what society thinks. Well, one round of applause for Sylvie Earle. I think she made it pretty clear that also, no matter if you're a girl or a boy or whatever, it is really important that you empower yourself and also in this very special field. And our next esteemed speaker is Andrea Strachinescu. She's the head of maritime innovation, marine knowledge and investment in the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries in the European Commission. Their aim is to create a better understanding of the ocean resources and advocate for a more sustainable use. This aim is also enshrined in one of the decade outcomes relating to a predictable ocean. So I'm very excited to hear your insights. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I had a couple of slides, but if they are not, no problem. I can, I can speak without. We human, we have a special relation to the ocean. We are always attracted because it offers us food, but also a way to travel. It started long time ago and can be seen in Egyptians, can, time can be seen also from the Chinese who developed seafood long time ago. What is happening is that with the time the ocean offered us more. In the, in the period of the 17th centuries, the British physicians... Ah, okay, great, thank you. So then the, it started to offer more because the British physicians, they said, it's good to go to the sea. It, it reinforces your health, so started to be promoted as a way to reinforce the health. And then the industries started to develop oil, gas, and currently we have almost 30% of the oil and gas that are extracted from the sea. We move on, and now we are speaking about offshore wind. So another, in, in, I would say, revolution is coming at sea. Oil and gas, some of them will stay on the ground, will make use of the ocean resources with new technologies and new industries. Europe and China are becoming the hotspot for the offshore wind. And in Europe, we are installing every year the equivalent of four coal power plants. So another revolution coming. But for this, we'll need new technologies, we'll need jobs, we'll need also to increase the productivity in order to pay, um, I would say, higher salaries in these jobs, to be able to develop the technologies that we want and to apply them. So we are speaking about robotics, we are speaking about artificial intelligence and the transformation, I would say, the classical industries that we have now at sea. 
What we have in Europe, and we should also take advantage, is the cultural heritage. 46% of the UNESCO sites underwater ones are in Europe. And for some countries like Croatia, the tourism is offering 20% of the GDP. So the ocean has a lot to offer to us. The idea is, for sure, how we are putting this in value, how also we are offering the salaries in this industry in order to be able to restore it, but also to be able to preserve what we have. Now, we heard about the restoration, the importance of the nature. Um, the developments are a win, the, uh, that are happening at sea are a win, I would say, a uh, win-win, because the offshore outside development platform for the new technologies can also protect the environment and give the possibility of nature to reborn, to recover. So the sea has a lot to offer us. What we need to work on, and this is something that we are still a lot, we have a lot to do, it's to know our ocean. And here we arrive at the marine knowledge. If we do not have the knowledge, it's not possible to master and to be able to take the advantage in a sustainable way of all, all everything that the ocean has to offer us. And for this, we need proper ocean observation. Our ambition is in Europe starting not only to make available data that it's coming through voluntary, I would say, um, uh, through voluntary uh, initiatives, but also to be able that we work all of us together, because at sea they are going various communities. Either they are divers, we heard earlier about citizen science project, either they are researchers, either there are various communities. We need to get to get, we need to work together to share assets and to be able really to make a contribution in terms of knowing the ocean, protecting and make better use of its resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Our next speaker was going to be Hannes Imhoff. Unfortunately, he can't be here us, uh, with us today. Um, he wanted to present something about a research project conducted on the Aldebaran, which is the marine research and broadcast vessel of the German Ocean Foundation. So if you want to hear more about what the Aldebaran does and what kind of projects are there, I would invite you to look on the screens that you can see on the exhibit floor as the yellow vessel, you can very easily recognize this, uh, will show up very frequently. After this, um, I would like to invite Patrick Goringer on stage. He is the manager of the international, o um, yeah, he is manager in, of the International Ocean Relations at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. Thank you very much for being here. And you can take one of these microphones and yeah, you can use this for your slides. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for that one. I just we. Half an hour ago, we launched the world's biggest citizen science uh, project. And that's a little bit what I'm going to show you about here. So I'm reusing those slides, slightly different audience. But let's, let's have a look at this one. Um, and my take on this is very focused on marine data and access to marine data. And this is exactly what we do within EMONET, which is the European Marine observation and data network. What we do is we pull together marine data from many, many different sources into one place. So people who want or need to use marine data, you can go here, you can download the data, everything is interoperable, meaning that we work a lot on the data to make this fit into different formats so you can recognize and you can download and you can get hold of whatever kind of data you want from the ocean. So you can discover, you can visualize, and you can download this data and the products together with it from one place. From seven 
different thematics. And you can see them, the seven different thematics there. I'm coordinating EvoNet Physics together with my colleague Antonio uh, since the very start of, um, of EvoNet. Um, that's, it's supported by the European Commission Digimare. Um, it was a report a couple of years ago with the goal to collect 20% of all the marine data from citizen science initiatives. And what I'll present to you here is really coming close to reaching that goal because it's gonna contribute a very, a, a big amount of data to make that available through citizen science uh, initiative. And what I mean is that we just connected since a month ago, we're collaborating with, uh, with divers, the German Ocean Foundation, the uh, Scuba Schools International, and the German Sailing Association. We're collaborating to, because every time a diver goes diving, if they have a dive computer on them, they also measure a temperature. Now, this data is incredibly important for scientists or any other one who wants to get hold of this kind of information. So why not make use of that vast network of scuba divers around the world and pull that data in and make it much more useful? So what, what I got a couple of weeks ago was um, I got a sample file, uh, a very modest 86,000 temperature profiles from divers around the world. This is a lot of data. Luckily enough, uh, my colleagues are extremely skilled on making use of this kind of information and looking at the data, pulling it into a common kind of format. And we managed within half an hour to pull all that data in um, to, to fit into the EmoNet program. It's just a kind of snapshot to give you from these 86,000 profiles to see, you can see where they're located. Now there's another 150,000 profiles and actually another 10 million observations that we can access through this network. It's pretty impressive. And if we look at Europe and the distribution of dives, you can also note that they are very coastal, which is where we have the biggest data gaps currently, is really in the coastal areas. This is a hotspot um, for us to find data on the coast, and this is gonna help us a lot to, to achieve that. I don't know if you see it, but typical kind of dive profiles from a diver, you can see how they've been going down to a 20 meter dive and then slowly going back up to the surface. Um, a temperature profile, uh, warm in the surface, colder down on 35 meters depth. This is the kind of ways we can visualize this kind of information. And then we take all that and we bring it straight into to EmoNet. This is a snapshot from the EmoNet physics uh, portal, but we're gonna then add all this data into that one place for anyone who wants to get hold of this kind of information. If you're interested, please have a look at the link up there. There's so much to discover. I really encourage you to go there and have a look at it. And we'll be going around uh, presenting on this, this program and this new, this new project that we're working on to various places starting in a couple of weeks. We go to the US, to Ocean Sciences. We'll be at Oceanology in London. We're going to the Ocean Decade Conference in launching this event. Thanks a lot. That's all for me. Thank you so much, Patrick. I think it really shows us how important it is to build this climate nexus between different, um, yeah, different disciplines and work together to find the right solutions. So thank you very much, and I'm very excited to see how the project will evolve. I now I'm pleased to welcome Tim Mollenhauer. He's the environmental consultant at Enthesis Group with a focus on the UN Ocean Decade outcome, a productive ocean. Tim will share insights on a special tool called Marine Shift 360. So I'm very excited to hear how it works and what kind of tool it is. Where is Tim? Ah, there you are. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Tim, Tim Mollenhauer. I'm a sustainability consultant and boat builder. And for the next five to four minutes, I want to be honest with you, truly honest. The marine industry, our industry, is currently not sustainable. 
We create these amazing vessels to spend time in this incredible ecosystem, yet with every boat built, with every mile sailed, we harm the environment that we enjoy so much. At the same time, our planet is in crisis and six out of nine planet boundaries are being crossed. To be truly honest, leisure and sports vessels in the European Union of up to 24 meters only produce 300 million tons of CO2 annually. Why am I saying only? because this comprises just 0.4% of the total European transportation sector. But we need to pose some honest questions here. Can we really compare a sector meant for leisure and enjoyment only to other important, um, important European sectors, such as the transportation sectors or other economic sectors? And what about other environmental impacts beyond carbon? What about noise pollution? What about black and grey waters, what about fuel leakages, and what about anti-fouling? While numerous innovations at this show are showcased um, to address those concerns, the answer or the best solution for the environment still remains elusive. Is marine, is electrification truly better than fuel propulsion? Or does the mineral or does the use of minerals in the production stage of the batteries uh, consume too much lithium and the environmental impact of that? Are flex fibers the answers to challenges of recycling GIP? Or does fle do flex, flex fibers consume too much water or land during their production stage on agricultural fields? Now, I promise you honesty, so I must admit I don't have the answers to those exact questions. But what if I tell you that there's a method to evaluate exactly those questions? Let me present you life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment, short LCA. LCAs are already a standard tool in the automotive and building sector. With LCA, you can calculate the environmental impact of your marine product in the marine, whole marine industry, for example, your boat, across the entire life cycle. So you can calculate from the raw material extraction over to manufacturing, distribution, use, and the end of life stage. So recycling or, or disposal. And it gets even better. We've developed Marine Shift 360, a tool in, with what you can not only calculate the environmental impact of a boat, but also identify hotspot areas across the life cycle. Is it the plug? Is it the mold? Is it the production stage? Where is your highest impact? And also, it helps you to save money because you can assess your water consumption or waste and there find process inefficiencies. It helps you to prepare for environmental legislations such as the EU Green Claims Directive, which was published last week. And it helps backing your claims and commitments with valid data. In Marine Ship 360, you can go beyond carbon and not only calculate your CO2 emissions, but also your waste, water, energy consumption, marine eutrophication. We have seven different impact categories included. We embarked on this journey with 11th Hour Racing, who integrated Marine Ship 360 into their design and build report. And now they're also integrating LCAs into their mocker class rules. The other example I brought with you is from Starboard, a global surfboard company, enhancing transparency by displaying their product's carbon footprint on their products, on labels, just like price tags. Ultimately, I have to admit that life cycle assessments are not the holy grail for the marine industry. But you can't manage what you can't measure. And Marine Ship 360 assists you with data-driven decision-making. So the next time you encounter a sustainability claim, also at this event, ask yourself, was the whole life cycle assessed? What data backs the claim? And do they go beyond carbon? We need to pose those important questions today, not for some distant future, but for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so honest with us. I think it really shows us that climate protection and environmental protection is not just a nice add-on that you can uh, yeah, just proclaim everywhere, but it's really a necessity and we all need to take action.
Please join me in welcoming Franziska Salman, our next speaker. She's the oceans campaigner and marine biologist from Greenpeace, Germany, and she discusses the imperative for a healthy and resilient ocean. Please welcome Franziska. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Take this one instead. Sorry. Yeah, welcome everybody. Nice to see you all here. And yes, in fact, as Laura said, I want to tell you about ecosystems that we have in our North Sea. And maybe unexpectedly, we have unique reefs in our North Sea. And um, this is an example of a stony reef as a close-up. Usually in the North Sea, there are muddy grounds, there's not much substrate for animals to cling on to and to uh, use it as a habitat, but there are some stones that aggregate and these can form so-called geogenic reefs, stone reefs. And here you can see um, a plumose anemone as a close-up and also some uh, bryozoa around. And these stony reefs are very important for the North Sea because they create an ecosystem and a habitat for um, other animals such as crabs and also mussels and they attract fish as well and so it, um, it improves the whole um, food net in the, in the North Sea. But I also want to tell you today why these unique ecosystems are at risk and that we need to do something to protect them. And first I want to start with this um, just a little technical map to show you which area I want to tell you about concretely. And we are here in the North Sea on the Dutch-German border. There's the island of Borkum. And we have different protected areas here. We have the Wadden Sea. We have also the protected area Borkum Reef and the protected area Borkum Reef Ground. And as these two um, protected area names already say, there are reefs there. But we have an area in the middle which is not protected. And in green you see gas fields that uh, a Dutch company wants to exploit and to drill for gas. And they also want to uh, lay a pipeline to the shore and uh, a power cable to the German side in red um, to get some energy for their gas platforms. And we are wondering if there are reefs to the north and to the south, and there's no protected area in the middle. Does this really mean that there are no reefs there? So um, we as Greenpeace, we did our own dives that you can see here in three different spots along um, the proposed cable route at the platform and also close to the proposed pipeline. And we found reefs. Also, this. Um, yeah, it is a bit more uh, blurry and the water is not as clear here in the tropics, but you can see on the ground there are a lot of rocks, there are anemones there, and here are divers from Submaris, um, scientific divers, maybe you know them from Terra X or other TV shows. And um, they do scientific gut diving and they um, took samples for us here, and they um, found in total um, 88 different species there. And we also had it analyzed by a um, scientific um, company and they looked closer at the little animals and we published this in this report, Oasis of Biodiversity. And yeah, some of the uh, animals were found were lobsters and shrimps. And every fifth of these species we found is in fact on the red list of endangered animals. So it's really important for us to protect these habitats. But we did not only look at that biologically, we also went out with a so-called side scan sonar and we um, could by that um, look at how many stones are there, how big these stones are and tell where there are a lot of stone reefs aggregating. And um, yeah, we also will publish this in another report. But we did not leave it with that. We also went to the proposed platform area and um, sent out these drifters. Um, we had it with GPS trackers to see how they will drift with, um, with the ocean and how in case of a ship heavy hazardous substances could, um, yeah, could drift along the ocean and could maybe impact those reefs and protected areas. And I'll quickly go over this. These are our results and they show that 
the hazardous substances could in fact reach the stone reefs and the protected areas very quickly in, uh, yeah, in a few hours to less than 24 hours. Um, yeah, we went to the media and to make the public more aware of, of it and we also um, go to the authorities in Lower Saxony and make them aware that there are stone reefs that they need to protect. So with this, I want to close and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francisca. Building on your discussion about a healthy and a resilient ocean through, for example, creating MPAs, I now want to turn your attention to the essential work of Christian Stock. He is the founder and first chairman of Krake, and his focus aligns with the Ocean Decade outcome, a clean ocean. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, and good evening all together. Yes, um, it's impossible to explain everything we can do in just five minutes. And maybe I'm the one with the worst English here in this round, but I try my very best. <laughs> I am the founder of Krake, which means Kölner Rhein Aufräum Kommando Einheit, which is a German shortcut. I can explain you later on if you want. What we do is organizing cleanups in Cologne and in the region of Cologne. And this is why we do it. As you all know, we have a massive problem with plastic pollution in the oceans. And here you can see um, yeah, the, the, the picture before. That was a beach in Thailand. And here you can see all the plastic coming with the waves. And this is not in Asia. This is in Cologne. This is a nature heritage area. And yeah, this is what we have after a high tide, after the flood, when the Rhine gets over like seven, eight meters. And here are some examples why animals suffer about that. We have fishing lines and plastic bags that get into the oceans. And the turtles think it's a jellyfish, they eat it. And this is the content of a stomach of a, of a whale. It's like uh, 80 plastic bags. And here we have some, some birds in, in their nest with all the plastic around and a hedgehog inside a Pringles box. Maybe most of you already did this, even me, starting balloons. It's a nice picture when they get out into, into the sky, colorful, but they don't rest. They don't end up in the sky. They come back down to earth. Then they land inside a tree, inside of, uh, on a field or even in the ocean. And there, if you search, the balloon is inside the turtle. Yeah. And this is what we do and what everyone can do. We are organizing cleanups in Cologne. As you can see, it's all very attractive people, <laughs> except me there. But this is a, a normal result of two, three, four hours collecting trash on the riverside. And this is exactly the same place after we have a high tide on the River Rhine. It's 3.7 tons of waste in the nature heritage area. 3.7 tons. We collected it with like 100 people in four hours, no problem. Once a year there is the Rhine cleanup, maybe you've heard about that, it's the second weekend on September and there are up to 800 people that are collecting trash with us. So we are the biggest and most attractive cleanup group in Germany. Hello, Brock Blocks. But you don't have to collect trash in a group, you can also do it by yourself when you're alone. When I'm in a, in a park and I see a picture like this, then it takes like two to five minutes. Wait, oh, wrong direction. Ha! I always have a pair of gloves with me. And yeah, this is what I can do. I, I show you the, the picture before. Oh, bad, 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 bad. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So it's so easy to do the right thing. 
Yeah, there are some articles that people always throw. Oh, oh, there's already a sign. I need to, I need to rush a bit. Yeah, um, cigarette butts, bad, bad, bad. <laughs> E-scooters, bad, bad. Don't throw it into the water. This is what we do because no one does it. We, uh, I'm a diver, and when, when you have low tide, I collect all the e-scooters in Cologne, out of the river, with my team. I can never do it by, by, by myself. I always need a nice and beautiful team. And we also have a museum where we expose some interesting things that we always find, like an old Fanta can from the 1970s, lighters, and yes, uh, speeches, speeches. And this is our litter trap. This is very interesting. You can find it on the pool right there. I can explain you uh, because I don't have any any more time, as I already said, it's impossible to explain everything in just like five minutes. But this is what our litter trap does. And if you have questions, you can ask us just right there. And yeah, oh yeah, many, many other things that we, that we got to know. And yes, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian. I think your pictures made it pretty clear that every single one of us has an impact and also can do something about it. Just don't throw your trash into the environment, but put it in a bin and recycle it. Let's continue our commitment to a cleaner and healthier ocean. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Rodrigo Butori, founder and chief angler of Plastic Fisherman. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you, Bud Dusseldorf, for uh, letting us tell a little bit of our story. Um, yeah, so we are plastic fishermen, and this is me. I'm just this small guy over there, one more human being in this huge, huge planet, right? I'm a surfer, I'm a diver, but I'm also an advertising guy. I've seen plastic pollution, you know, when I'm surfing above water, I'm seeing plastic pollution underwater, and it's one of those things that was always there, right? It was always present in my life growing up, and I was cleaning up the ocean, but it was just there. Uh, until one day, uh, when I read this study by the MacArthur Foundation uh, that said that in just a few decades, there could be more plastic than, o than uh, fish in our ocean, and that was a huge, huge statement and a big, big call for me. I knew I had to do something, and it was only fair because the ocean has given me so much, I had to give back somehow. But again, hear me out. I'm just that tiny guy, right? What can I do? Uh, how can a single individual can make a difference, right? And that's the problem with marine plastic pollution and all the other climate problems. They are huge, and you feel tiny with, uh, you know, against them. And you just don't know what to do, you feel powerless. And I know that people care about it, right? Uh, but we are overwhelmed, we don't know what to do. But I was convinced to try. So what I, wanted, what I did was I used my powers as a creative guy, and I started making fish with the plastic I clean up. I was like, okay, plastic fish, right? That's, that's what's happening. Our ocean, this will be the number one species in our ocean if you don't pay attention. And I started posting that on Instagram, and I called myself the plastic fisherman, and the message was very simple. If you don't pay attention, again, plastic fish will be the number one species in our ocean. Uh, I called that activity plastic fishing, and I invited more people to do that by creating you know, five steps. So pick up a few pieces of plastic, five or more, use them to make a little fish, you know, take a picture of your catch, share on Instagram using the hashtag plastic fishing, clean it up and dispose of it properly. And by doing that, you become yourself a plastic fisherman, just like me, right? So if you don't follow us, please do. And Plastic Fisherman became then this place that it's a safe space for people to start, an inspiring place for people to get, you know, acquainted with the problem, learn about what's going on, and engage with it without that pressure of feeling like guilty or feeling powerless. So it started and it worked it, and now we are all over the world, you know? Uh, we have 
nine accounts around the world. We have plastic fishermen in UK, plastic fishermen in Spain, plastic fishermen in Brazil, plastic fishermen in Germany here with Dagmar and Gabi. Uh, we have plastic fishermen in Bahamas and so forth, and thousands and thousands of people participating. And what's great about plastic fishing is that it's not only an activity that you get to express your care for the ocean, you get to show that you are creative, and you get to you know, show your friends that you're doing something about it, but you learn about the problem instinctively as you are making the fish. You're seeing that piece of plastic, you're thinking about that type of plastic, you're seeing life growing, you're thinking about currents. It's a really good tool to learn about what's going on and to change your ways when you go home after you clean that up. Uh, today, like I said, we are in many, many countries. We have what we call the plastic fishing festivals. We had more, over 60 of those. You know, they're basically big cleanup events that we have a party at the beach. We you know with music. You know, with fun, we make quite a bit of, of fishes. We clean that that up, and we had in over um, nine, uh, four continents. Um, and if you want to know about the next one, please stop at our table over there and we can tell you about the one that's going to happen at the Rhine. Uh, we also took plastic fishing out of the beach and out of the rivers into classrooms and into education organizations. So we are at schools, we are the Girl Scouts of America, you know, we are at our museums. So again, it was just a cool way to educate the new generation about the problem and grow more responsible, better human beings. So for the last four years, I've done all kinds of fish, right? And it's been a really good challenge and it continues to be a fun challenge because now I don't see plastic anymore as I'm walking around. I see a fin, I see an eye, I see a tail, and that invites me to pick up that plastic. And a lot of people say the same. Uh, but the thing I'm most you know, proud of is what we accomplished together as a global decentralized community. We have done more than 10,000 fish all over the world in 94 countries and over 40,000 pounds of trash removed one fish at a time. Um, but then I learned about the second problem with marine plastic pollution. I see 30 seconds right there. What happens to the plastic, right? Are we cleaning up that plastic? Where are we taking this plastic? Are we moving it from an island of plastic in the ocean to a mountain of plastic inland? Because we know that most countries have a, not a good system of a uh, recycling system. So with that, we started Plastic Fisherman Workshop, and that's our next step. It's where we're trying to use that same creativity, that same design mindset to turn some of the plastic that we clean up into objects. And Instead of giving it an end, we're giving it a new beginning. Uh, so again, I just want to go back to this image over here to remind myself, hey, I'm just this tiny little guy, just like you are. But we're not just one. We are a billion tiny little people, right? And we can choose to be a billion problems and do nothing, or we can be eight billion solutions. So. What I wanted to ask you guys today is to give back somehow, right? We are at this amazing fair, right? It's a, a water sports fair. We're celebrating this playground that we have, and I want you guys to collaborate and give back somehow. Pay the ticket for everything you're getting, because the ocean needs you. So thank you. Let's go plastic fishing. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. I think you made it pre pretty clear that we can't solve this problem alone and we need all hands on deck. We now turn to our next speaker, Dr. Joachim Harms. He is the chairman of the executive board of the German Marine Research Alliance. And the alliance unites 24 marine research institutions in Germany, bridging the gap between research and the real world impact, making the ocean more accessible. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And especially for science, it's important that we have an accessible ocean where we can go and it's a basis for marine science. The German Marine Research Alliance, as already pointed out, combines about 24 marine institutions in Germany and it's built up by the federal ministry and the five northern states of Germany. And the main thing is that the knowledge which is available in science is really transported to the society, to the business, and to the politicians. So it's very important really to prepare knowledge-based solutions for the problems we already saw in the earlier presentations. And for that, I think it's a network of universities and research institutions essential so that the different uh, disciplines are really cooperating and work together. So the 
DAM, the German Marine Research Alliance, is a platform for coordination of research activities in Germany. So the most important thing that we have four pillars where we are active, it's a research activity by itself, it's then the transfer of the knowledge to the society, and what is the most important is, and it was already pointed out by Patrick, is that the data gained by, by science is really available and accessible also for the society. So the data storage, the data conservation is the most important thing which we are looking in. And the other thing is science you can't do without the essential infrastructure. So you need quite expensive tools to observe the environment in the ocean. At the moment, we have three main research activities run. The first one is focusing on the CO2 balance. So the marine environment plays a very important role in storage of CO2. In the past, 40% of the CO2 produced by uh, us is already stored in the ocean and within the mission marine carbon sinks and the decarbonization pathway, we look into the possibilities to enhance the storage of CO2 in the ocean. The other mission is about the protection and sustainable use of the marine environment, especially in the coastal areas. So there's a lot of changes going in on our coastal areas. There's now a very heavy industrialization of the coastal zones, especially now with the offshore wind parks, which are growing up. And the third one is focusing on risk management. As you may remember, in October, we had this hard storm uh, in the Baltic Sea with the floods on the, in, in Schleswig-Holstein. So there was a lot of disaster by that. So we have to look into these tools, how we can really predict these uh, extreme events in future to uh, avoid uh, major destructions in our coastal areas. To foster the transfer of knowledge, we prepare special information leaflets, and we also now are under construction for a digital information portal and an interactive word ocean, where you can really dive into these very impressive uh, different uh, environments in the ocean to get an understanding how it functions and how it works. And these tools will be available at the end of this year. So I think by that it's also getting into schools and, and for uh, different uses also in the museums um, so that there's a good information what is really going on in our marine environment. I think by that I stop here and uh, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking very much forward for the next presentations. Thank you very much Joachim. I think you've made it pretty clear that although the ocean is facing a lot of threats, the ocean holds also a lot of solutions to mitigate the climate problems that we are facing. Now, let's turn our focus to the imperative of a safe ocean with our next speaker, Dr. Wolfgang Sichermann. He's the managing director of the Seascape GmbH, and he will explain more about the military contaminated sites in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Wolfgang, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Well, hello. Uh, the topic I'd like to talk, you don't see, you don't smell, you do not really sense, but it's there, it's out there, it's quite close to our lovely seaside shores, and it poses a threat to the marine environment. I'm talking about munitions, grenades, bombs, torpedoes, mines, which have been sunk in the sea very close to our shores. And to understand what has happened, we have to go back some 80 years in time 
Directly after the capitulation of Nazi Germany, the Allies started to sink German munitions in the sea. Everything no longer, were no longer used for was dumped in zones very close uh, to the shore in the Baltic Sea, but also in the North Sea. As you can see, small boxes, but also heavy warheads, which are now somewhere around. Those activities have been quite well documented, and um, a 10 years period research of historians and data miners or data analysts brought up some estimate figures what we are dealing about. Just in German waters, you'll find about 1.6 million tons of remnants of war. About, one, one says, 1.3 1, 1, 1 million, this means the majority in the North Sea, just the German coast, I would like to say, and another 300,000, which is still a lot, in the Baltic Sea. Just in the Baltic Sea, in one to two kilometers of distance from the shore. I said it was quite well um, documented where to find it, so many researchers have also extensively explored those sites by the use of such autonomous vessels, but also other types of sensors, uh, bringing images, video images, bathymetric data, as well as magnetic, magnetic data, so that today we have quite a good idea of what is going on there on the sea, and you have one picture here, a dumping site which is very close to Kielfjord, where you see huge arsenals of various warheads, like these large cylinders, ground mines, but you see also torpedo heads, more of those conic activities, or when you look to other sites in, the, in another bay, you find boxes with just uh, army munition or bombs, etc. With those things being there for some 70 to 80 years, with the shells corroding, um, the munitions release step by step the explosive compounds to the sea. So you find nearly everywhere in the sea concentrations of here like this TNT or other munition compounds, which are of course taken off uh, by the, uh, or taken absorbed uh, by marine life, by biota, getting into the food chain. Here you can see munitions uh, are concentrated in the, in the German bait in the North Sea. The, the, concentrates, uh, the concentrations are quite high, of course, very close to the dumping sites, but also far off uh, you can uh, find those concentrates. On the other side, um, in the Baltic, the situation is severe. Here the concentrations, uh, the concentrations are up to a figure of 100 uh, factor higher due to, well, let's say, the, the conditions there. You have shallow water, you have no tides, very low dynamic uh, in the water exchange, and here also you can uh, prove that um, munition compounds can be found in uh, fish which are very close to the sea bottom, close to, the, uh, uh, close to those dumping sites. And um, up today, um, those um, explosive compounds can be found in the bile and other organs of the fish, but uh, one should expect that, of course, uh, the concentrations will increase further on, and maybe in the end it could also pose some risk to the human food chain. Having this in mind, and having said that, um, the federal um, government of Germany has set up an action program with the aim to start with a systematic removal and disposal of uh, those munitions close to, the uh, close to the shore. And of course, it's in a way similar to the plastic issue. We were facing a huge amount, and one, uh, one program will not solve the problem. But uh, the idea is to get it started, to show that on a large-scale basis, we are able to dispose and reduce the threat for the environment in such a process, starting from the, um, yes, um, from the exploration until the final disposal of um, the munitions. Um, I have to stop, I see. So that just two stages. Um, this year we're going to explore um, um, dump sites in the Lübeck Bay to learn about what are really the conditions of those stuff which have been there for 70 years, how to handle it, how to dispose. And in the next step, 
um, we're designing a process where um, the recovered munitions can already be disposed at sea, not facing any more danger um, to people and life on shore as well. Uh, coming to an end, um, I think uh, you have had another view to the ocean, what is been, uh, below. I think the problem is addressed, not only by the German government, also on other neighbor countries in the European Union. And so I hope this topic is no longer out of your mind. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. I think not all of you have known about this topic, so it's very good that you mentioned it. Now, let's welcome our next speaker, and I'm very happy to announce Emily Penn. She's the founder of Expedition and an ambassador of the Love Your Ocean stage. Her work contributes to the Ocean Decade outcome in inspiring and engaging ocean. So let's hear how you do this. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here sharing some stories. Now, my journey into ocean advocacy actually began as a way to hitchhike from England to Australia to a new job as an architect without taking an aeroplane. So when I turned to Google to find an opportunity, this just popped up on my laptop. This is Earthrace, a record-breaking boat that runs on 100% biofuel. And so I wrote to the skipper and I said, how do I get a job on board? He said, come and meet us for the weekend. And I didn't go home for another 923 days. Off I went across the Atlantic and the Pacific. Now, the inside of Earth Race isn't quite as glamorous as that sleek silver exterior might have made you think. And I shared this smelly cabin with three New Zealand boys. And if we wanted to take a wash, we had no running water, so we had to simply stop the boat and jump over the side, which is what we did one day in the middle of the Pacific. And when we came up to the surface, I couldn't believe that I saw a toothbrush, a cigarette lighter, and a bottle top just floating by, 800 miles from nearest land. And it just didn't make any sense. So instead of taking the job as an architect, I spent the next 10 years sailing all over the planet, from the tropics to the poles, to these gyres, the accumulation zones, where all of this plastic eventually ends up trying to find out what impact it's having and ultimately what we can do about it. On this journey, I also saw the impact that climate change was having on our planet, particularly these small islands where rising sea levels were causing their soil to become so salty that their crops wouldn't grow. We also saw the impact of increased sea temperatures on coral reefs causing bleaching, and we saw that the seas were being emptied by commercial fishing vessels, so much so that the local communities could no longer rely on fishing as their main source of food. And the knock-on effect of that was importing food and drink in plastic packaging, which we then saw on the shorelines, mid-ocean, and also the impact on marine life. And even on a voyage through the Northwest Passage, over the top of Canada, we saw their ice melting at unprecedented rates. We spent days, months, on this open ocean and had the most magical moments as well, with dolphins at the bow, navigating by the stars and gathering on deck every night to watch yet another episode of awe-inspiring sunset in the sky. But we also survived storms. We felt the power of raw wilderness in a way that I had never experienced before when living buffered by our built environment on land. And I couldn't believe how this vast ocean that seemed so powerful and so endless could possibly be impacted by us, humans. But it turns out that's exactly what's happening. I went on to learn about the emissions that we're putting up into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels and, of course, seeing the plastic every second of every day finding its way into the sea. And I started to realize that with all of these big problems, 
actually trying to attempt cleanup of our skies, our oceans, even our bodies, is just the most immense challenge. And that instead, right now, we have an opportunity to turn off the tap, to work at the source to prevent this issue getting any worse. So when we're doing our research, we try and work out, well, what is the source? Particularly with the plastic, where is it all coming from? Especially when it looks like this. There's no brand name written on the side. These microplastics that cover our ocean, 171 trillion of them, they are anonymous. And so we use an FTIR, we look at the polymer type, we pick up on lots of clues to try and understand where they might have come from. But when I get the data back, I am just blown away by the sheer number of different types of plastic out there, meaning that it's used for so many different things and comes from so many different sources. But each one of these sources represents a different solution. There's no silver bullet to tackle plastic pollution or climate change, but the good news is there are hundreds of solutions out there. So my question to you all to finish today is what is your superpower? We all have a role to play to work on one of these many solutions to bring to the table. We don't need everyone to do everything, we just need everyone to do something. It's time to find our role and time to act. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for these inspiring words. We will continue our short, but we're almost at the end, our um, Ocean Forum with another speaker who will focus on um, the inspiring and engaging ocean. Her name is Denise Verl. She's the secretary of the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. Denise, we're eager to hear your insights on how you inspire and get people engaged. There you are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Once again to the Ocean Forum, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here, to be part of uh, this network. And in this short slot, I will try to give some information that you might be already familiar with. So um, what I want to start with, after all seeing these wonderful um, topics, I realized that we all actually share um, a passion for water-related activities, right? And today's gathering is actually a celebration of our common um, interest. So let's dive more into and yeah, let's take a moment and to reflect uh, what is the Earth's water distribution related to this, the water that brings us all together. So um, the ocean holds approximately 97% of the planet's water, right? While the remaining 3% um, is distributed in glaciers, maybe, maybe ice, as you can see here, or underground reservoirs, as well as rivers and lakes. But this small, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if, it, anyway, uh, you see a small uh, drop simulation above, and actually that illustrates the less than this 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water. And it is very essential, right, to sustain the life. So looking from a different perspective, the ocean actually also covers 70% of the planet's surface. And the deep sea uh, constituting the, sorry, oops, no. The deep sea is constituting the 50%. The Pacific Ocean alone surpasses um, the overall 
land of the earth we are talking about. And notably, the um, oceans play a critical role in mitigating climate change by observing over 90% of the extra heat power we are talking about. Uh, sorry, heat energy. And I also want to point out another uh, information. So did you also know that almost half of the oxygen generated by the photosynthesis comes from the ocean? In another way, maybe if we consider biodiversity, the ocean is home to roughly one million different various species of plants, animals, uh, and we are talking about those animals actually with up to two to third uh, yet to be named or described. However, there is also an increasing, uh, as we all know, uh, threat loom. And the ocean's pH level has decreased from 8.2 to 8.1 due to the carbon dioxide absorption and uh, resulting in a 30% um, um, increase in acidity. Although the greatest threat uh, or the norm, the notion uh, is the someone okay, will come to save our planet. But actually, we, we don't need anybody else's or superheroes. We, we know that it is our responsibility to overcome this challenge. So what we can do then? We saw many, many great examples. And I just want to point out, for instance, we are talking about an open ocean or deep sea areas. And this means uh, maybe sustainable requires increased international cooperation to support uh, the vulnerable habitats. So quickly to give an, I, okay, I will just quickly wrap up here about the organization that I'm part of. They are focusing, for instance, food waste, uh, pollinators, so on and so forth. So what we can do here is establishing a system that we can actively take part of. So I would like to wrap up uh, my sentences is, most importantly, let's share or let's spread the message about the importance, the critical importance of the marine life and why we must actively work to protect it all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, and for motivating us to make waves and work together on the protection of the marine environment. Now for our last speaker, let's give a warm welcome to Clara Heinrichs. She's a bachelor student at the Technical University of Berlin and has some, has some cool insights to share about Onesie, a student-made boat reshaping the world of sustainable yachting. Thank you so much for coming, Clara. Thank you. Um, I think I have to press here. Yeah, perfect. Um, I have the honor to represent an amazing team today. Some of them are here. Um, the ones in the blue shirt with the yellow star, um, that's us. In total, we are 40 students from the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, and two years ago, uh, caused through COVID boredom, there came up the idea uh, to build an e-boat. <laughs> Before I explain more about what we do, I'd like to um, tell you more about um, how everything started. So, during COVID, all of us had to stay at home for months uh, and just wait. It was as if someone had pressed the pause button. 
But truth is, what we must not forget, climate change doesn't make a pause. And we, as the future engineers, have a responsibility. We have the responsibility to solve technical problems. So why wait if nothing's stopping us from making an impact now? Um, so what we decided to do was to build our own sustainable boat with, um, powered by an electric emission-free motor. Um, and to spill the tea, <laughs> it worked out. Um, you can see it live and not in action over there uh, behind the rail. Um, you need to know that shipping traffic is causing 2.9% of emissions worldwide. E-mobility is not that common on the water yet, um, so there is a lot of work for us to do. Um, but regarding sustainability, not only an emission-free propulsion is important, but a circular system, um, including disposal, materials, and so on. So we um, decided to use batteries with um, recyclable and exchangeable compartments, so it's easier for us to adjust them to our needs, and they live longer. Um, we use as many nature materials as possible, like wood, bamboo, flax fiber, and to be honest, it hasn't always been easy, especially um, just imagine how to get bamboo in that size. It's five meters long, super thick. Um, carbon is much more light, but we stick to bamboo, so um, yeah, we made it, and we are very proud um, of our unique eco look. <laughs> um, and sometimes we really get the questions if we can fly. <laughs> so no, these solar panels uh, are no wings. We um, stay on the water. Um, it's a boat. It's made for transport, so what do we do it for? Uh, we compete with other university teams uh, in different uh, competitions. The most famous one is the Monaco Energy Boat Challenge. Um, it's once a year, and university teams from all over the world, even from India, Canada, come to Monaco in July um, to compete against each other in different um, classes. We are in the energy class. Um, and we are very proud to say that last year and this year, we have been the first um, German team. Um, my last point um, is a very important one. The whole project depends on it, because we are students, we have the motivation, we have the knowledge, but we don't have the money to realize this project. Um, we started with nothing but that idea, and we don't get any financial support uh, by our university, so everything is financed by sponsorships. And luckily, we could convince great people and companies um, who believed in our vision and, yeah, and made that work out. So I would like to use that opportunity to say thank you to them and um, many greetings to the rest of the team in Berlin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clara, for showing what is possible. I'm actually very curious to see you racing on that boat, so I might come to Monaco and watch you. Um, this concludes our session for today, and I want to give a huge thanks to all our speakers for sharing their expertise, their insights, and especially their love and passion for the ocean. Please feel free to grab a drink. We have some free drinks over there to continue the discussion connect with the speakers, and I hope that you have all a great evening. Thank you so much for joining.